Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first webinar of 2017. I want to wish everyone here who joined us today a Happy New Year. My name is Jeff Perkins. I'm the CMO of QA Symphony. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we're a leading provider of software testing solutions. Uh, and if you want to learn more about us uh, or do a free trial, just uh, check us out at qasymphony.com. Uh, this year, we're really excited. We're starting off with one of our uh, most popular webinar topics, uh, software testing trends for the year ahead. And once again, uh, for the third year, actually, we're lucky to have with us um, our friend and advisor, Keith Klein, to give us his thoughts on, uh, on what lies ahead. So uh, I want to thank Keith for being here with us. Before, uh, before we begin, I'm just going to go through some quick housekeeping items just to make sure uh, uh, we all get the best experience out of this webinar. So uh, the audio through the, for the webinar is delivered through your computer, um, through the computer. So turn your speakers up, use headphones. Uh, if your audio is choppy at all, um, sometimes that's the, uh, the internet connection you're on. So just try to, uh, sometimes you move closer to the wireless router, uh, hardwire in with an ethernet, or uh, even just refreshing your browser or switching browsers, uh, that all could help you. You are able to customize your webinar viewing experience here. Uh, all those kind of widgets you see on your screen, you could increase or decrease the size or reduce them. Uh, and you'll notice the Q&A widget on the left. So if you have any questions, uh, whether they're technical or questions for the speaker, just uh, put them in that widget and someone will get back to you. Uh, if you just want to see the presentation in all of its glory and just make that full screen, uh, I'll point you to the little icon that's in the upper right. Uh, you just click on that, and then the presentation will be full screen. If you want to get out of it, you just press escape, and you go in and type a question. But that will give you the biggest uh, viewing experience for all the webinar slides. A um, few final things. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and available on demand after the webinar ends. You will get an email uh, with a link to watch it again or to share it with colleagues. Uh, we will be live tweeting uh, this webinar, so uh, if you want to join in the conversation on Twitter, uh, the hashtag is Testing Trends. Uh, again, Q&A widget there is on the left. Um, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar, and some we might ask during the webinar. Uh, and at the very end, after, uh, after we sign off, a short survey will pop up. So if you could uh, just take that survey and let us know how we did, we would appreciate the feedback. Um, I, before we uh, kind of get into the content today, I just want to let you know about an upcoming webinar that you might be interested in, Where Testers and QA Fit in the Story of DevOps. Uh, this should be a great one, uh, talking about uh, uh, where, um, you know, how, how testing teams need to evolve um, in this new world of DevOps that we live. And that's going to be on February 22nd. If you look in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, there's a resources widget, uh, and there is a link so you can register right now for that webinar if you'd like to attend. But that should be a really good one. Uh, it's featuring Sunil Singhal from uh, TechArchix and Ryan, or Ryan Yackel, Director of Product Marketing for QA Symphony. One last plug before we move on. Um, QA Symphony does an annual conference. We call it Quality Jam. Uh, we're very excited this year. It's going to be April 18th and 19th in Atlanta. So if you are interested in attending Quality Jam, we are giving away one ticket. Uh, just email marketing at qasymphony.com and you'll be entered to win. Uh, we also have early bird pricing right now, so you can save 100 bucks. And I will say the speaker lineup for this uh, conference is amazing. Uh, Keith Klein, who's on this webinar, will be there. Uh, Angie Jones, Michael Bolton, uh, Jeffrey Hammond from Forrester. Uh, we have speakers coming in from uh, Disney, uh, Vonage. So it's going to be a really, really great lineup. Uh, get some knowledge about software testing and see where, uh, see where the industry is going. So I highly encourage you to check it out. Uh, go to qualityjam.com to get more information. Um, so we're going to start uh, this webinar out today with a, a quick poll before I introduce Keith. Um, so, so the question for you now is, what is the biggest technology trend that will impact your company in 2017? Uh, the biggest trend that will impact your company in 2017, is it around automation, DevOps, AI, machine learning, IoT, uh, everything on demand, or cybersecurity? Just uh, Take a minute and uh, answer that question. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide, so we'll start to see uh, we'll start to see some of the results. Automation, everything automation uh, looks like to the clear winner, uh, which is uh, good because I think Keith's going to talk a little bit about automation today. So um, 
So really uh, interesting results. Looks like cybersecurity, Internet of Things, and everything on demand are much lower than DevOps and automation. Um, so so uh, pretty, pretty interesting there. Um, and with that, I want to introduce uh, our friend Keith Klain. Keith is the Executive Director, Head of Software Quality Management for Techmark Global Solutions, a full-service telecom and technology consultancy provider. For the last 20 years, Keith has built software quality management and testing teams for global financial services and IT consulting firms in the U.S., U.K., and Asia Pacific. He was the Executive Vice President for the Association of Software Testing and the recipient of the 2013 Test Professionals Luminary Award. So, Keith, welcome. Uh, we thank you for being with us. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thank you for reading that. <laughs> That's a, it's a great bio. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is great. I'm very happy to be back here. Uh, this is what the third year in a row we've done this, and uh, I get to muse about what's uh, going to happen the last year and what uh, what's going to happen this year and the implications for testing. Um, so the uh, the first thing, and I think I'm I'm driving here now, as I, as I usually do, before I like to talk, is um, give out a couple disclaimers so that people know how to uh, put what I'm saying or my perspective in context. So you know, I've I've worked for a long time in what I call enterprise tech, which is non-technology companies that build technology. So what I want to talk about today is based on, you know, my opinions on what I've seen from clients, uh, doing testing work with clients, um, feedback I've got from folks in conferences. So I do speak and attend at a lot of conferences, and then as well just kind of general talking to people in the industry and testers. So um, one thing, uh, as this was kind of getting publicized, and I continually get asked every year, which I'm not going to do is endorse any specific products. Um, that's uh, this, the, not we're going to get into that today. You can contact me privately if you want to know my, my views on things, other than obviously the QA Symphony. Um, but uh, any other than that, I'm not endorsing any products. And then you know this is it's there's so much you know in the in the world of technology, it's impossible to cover it all. But I want to really spin this towards you know opportunities for the testing community or testers to you know, grow uh, uh, market opportunities and, and look at it from that perspective. So the, the, the quick thought I had on, on 2016, and uh, if people know me, I'm a fan of Groucho Marx, was the quote that kept ringing in my ears was, um, you know, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? And you know, 2016 was a very interesting year for technology. Um, no, we're not there yet. Um, so <laughs> it was an interesting year for technology. Um, and I think one of the things was that it's kind of changed our relationship to technology in a way that was probably always there, but in the kind of broader population hadn't really um, dawned on a lot of folks and just how deeply ingrained uh, it is in our lives. You know, the, the, the big story, obviously, of 2016 was, you know, the, the DNC uh, hacking. And, you know, I, I promise I'm not going to get into politics today, um, but, you know, that, that was a huge uh, impact on, on a lot of things, a very broad range of, of implications there. You know, fake news in our Facebook feeds, you know, um, Yahoo revealing a three-year-old hack that affected about a billion accounts, I, I think was the final number. You know, we had phones catching on fire, uh, finding out about uh, environmental impact from the auto industry that, you know, got through testing. Um, so I think, you know, and not to put too sober a point on it, that, that ethics and technology has a, you know, is presenting a huge opportunity for testers and, and, and testing and that we have a really big role to play in that. And there's a lot of folks actively discussing this right now about, you know, the, the, the systems we're building now. How does, how do ethics uh, play into that, you know, how do, and, and how do testers, you know, fit, fit into that, and, and what's the role of objective kind of unbiased uh, testing, and, and so I think that's, that's, it's setting up the, the, the future of testing, which seems to, you know, swing wildly between, you know, dead and alive, as uh, a v very much alive, and a very, very much important, more so than maybe people had anticipated role, so um, with that 
very sobering <laughs> view or serious thought. Jeff, are you ready to play some buzzword bingo? Of course, Keith. Always ready to play buzzword bingo. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. So, look, um, here's the things I, I want to cover off off today, and, and things that are trending. I don't think there will be any you know big big shockers there. You know, I think the first one around predictive analytics and 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 um, uh, artificial intelligence. You know, they they kind of get used interchangeably a lot of times. And the way that helps me think about it is, you know, uh, as, as explained to me before, is AI is really the kind of science of making machines intelligent. And machine learning is, you know, the, the, the algos, the algorithms that, that make machines smarter. So, you know, it, for example, it would be the, you know, Google suggesting, did you mean this when you, you type in something in their search? And, you know, I think, you're going to see, and as a, as a market opportunity for you know, improving the user experience beyond um, just kind of analytics of your purchase history. As, as data gets shared and gets gets you know that funnel gets made wider, you'll see you know apps that can actually guide decisions beyond just suggestions. Um, you know, they they uh, the, the, there's an increased presence, probably you know to some some folks, annoyingly so. Uh, in your everyday life with the, with the big mesh and, you know, the, the things get, uh, you know, cross-referenced. I see my, you know, Amazon suggestions showing up in my Twitter feed and it gets deeper and deeper integrated every year. Um, and, and, you know, for me personally, you know, I'm not really interested in getting advice from my toaster on what, what pants I should buy, but as you see, uh, see this stuff, get further and further integrated, there's going to be more in terms of user experience and, and trying to help people guide their, their, their personal habits. Um, in terms of data visualization, and this is something I'm particularly interested in, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, in, in terms of test analytics, but, you know, there's, particularly for the enterprise, you know, they're still kind of struggling with big data. I think there's you know, a lot of progress been made in this, but, you know, outside of a couple communities, so if you look at something like the scientific community, you know, they've done a really good job in some instances in visualizing, uh, visual representation of some of the data. If you look at some of the stuff they've done around global warming, you know, sea ice melting, there's some really interesting things that can help people understand the, the, the data uh, and the implications a little bit more. Um, you see this in social media all throughout the year, of course, the, the course of the election. You, know, you saw a lot of visual representations of the debates. Um, and, and so there's certain markets that are, that are really ahead of this. But from in terms of the enterprise, from what I've, what I've talked to folks this, uh, last year and, and this year about already, actually, is that there's just a lot of focus on the kind of quantitative analysis and not really – um, doing much or, or not really you know, evolved enough yet in terms of visualizing that. So there's, there's, there's an opportunity for companies to, to, to make some, some progress there and, and do some meaningful correlations. You know, if you look at something like Google, you know, that does a, you know, a very, very data-driven decision-making organization, all the work they did on diversity and all the data mining they did on, on diversity and actually, you know, it didn't necessarily drive all the right behavior. So I, I believe their, their uh, diversity stats got worse year on year. So there's a, there's a lot of improvement there um, to, to be made as well. The, uh, obviously, in the smart home technology market, there's, there's a huge growth potential there. Um, despite all the security concerns and you know you look at things like that uh, that hack that happened last i think it was in the fall octoberish you know where there was denial of service attack through all sorts of bots that took down some pretty big players you know twitter ebay like netflix was affected um and despite all that uh there's just a massive uh, growth in this market, um, the, and, and the primary driver behind that seems to be apps and tech. And you know, I think that I was looking into this a little bit, and it's estimated to be about a hundred billion dollar uh, market by 2020. You know, just the smart home uh, uh, market alone. You know, and and I always feel like this when I see a big hack or some security breach that it's going to become 
more of a priority, and I don't think people have seen – we've been more adaptive towards the hacks than kind of pre- preventative, if that makes sense. And it's still not uh, – security still doesn't seem to be as big a priority, so I don't know what needs to actually happen. But, again, I thought there was going to be massive changes after the Knight Capital uh, fiasco in, in, in trading, and there's been some changes, but not, not the substantive ones. Um, and, and, and I think so what you'll see in this market, and, and I guess this may be a year or two year play on this, is some consolidation. It's just the market's overrun with everybody making something smart. And, you know, the, the, they need to move beyond that kind of hub mentality and really start make, making this stuff integrate with each other, which is another opportunity for, for, for testing. Um, automation, which, you know, is, again, a very political issue, and this is beyond just test automation, but, you know, in all sorts of non-tech fields, in manufacturing, robotics, you know, again, you're going to see big, big growth in this, and, and, and the intelligence and ability of modern robotics is just leaps and bounds. Uh, it grows every year. You know, so much so that this, this is such an important issue that I, I, President Obama even addressed it in his, his outgoing statement about his concern for the, uh, I think it's around 20-odd million federal employees that work for the U.S. government. Um, you know, I can see this impact in, in where you'll feel it the most um, in the next maybe year to 18 months is in middle management. There was a fantastic quote the other day by the CEO of Microsoft that he said, yeah, uh, about 30% of a CEO's job could be automated. Um, so, you know, that's that's an interesting thought coming from coming from. I tweeted back at him, but interestingly, he didn't reply. Uh, you, you know, but this is having you know a, we've lost more jobs to productivity than we have to to, to offshoring. Um, you know, you look at the Amazon impact on stores like Sears and some of the big box retailers, you know, despite some of the structural problems with Sears, you know, that's, that's having an impact. You know, there's, there, there, people are shopping online more and more every year, and I think there's a potential backlash on, on innovation uh, to the extent, particularly in the political climate we're in right, ne- climate we're in right now in the U.S., of, you know, kind of, you know, rebirth of the Luddites, you know, and kind of a tech backlash. So uh, that that's something that I think, you know, in, around embedded systems, you know, particularly that that's, that's a, a, an area to watch. You know, and lastly here in terms of trends, you know, and I, you know, I, I go back and forth on this as well, but augmented shopping and marketing is a huge, you know, growth opportunity. You know, Pokemon Go was a phenomenon um, this year, uh, despite, me not playing it um but uh, you know you can see all sorts of stores start like virtual reality and augmented reality you know i was reading an article the other day about a camping uh store that is you know doing virtual trials of their equipment um with, with people that's what they they plan to do is you know have people be able to see and and use their stuff you know in a virtual environment which, you know, done properly, and I think we've got a little bit ways to go, you know, but you just imagine how short the feedback loop would be into your you know, development or product management group. That would be extremely short, um, you know, and, and, and as well it's got all sorts of opportunities to enhance the user experience in a, in again, a, in a kind of immediate way, you know, and, and it's a, another knock-on effect is in the retail markets where you've got, the ability now to size and custom fit your own shirts at home, you know. The, so so there's, there's all sorts of amazing stuff that we can do now with this. Um, and and another, another thing that I, you know, I think is an opportunity for testing is in um, th- these kind of smart stores, right? And, and the, the, the immediate effect I see this uh, right now is around kind of targeted campaigns. Like if you look at, you know, the, the cartwheel, at the target cartwheel, where you're getting focused and 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 uh, specific marketing on on uh, content and coupons as you're walking through the aisles, so you you kind of have smart aisle suggestions as you as you walk around through there. 
Um, you know, the, the other the other thing there is around the Amazon Go, which is already a, a reality, where they're linking the same technology that does inventory management with checkout to uh, manage real-time in-store demand as people are shopping and putting things on, putting things back on the shelves and, and managing that in real time whilst also uh, leveraging, you know, checkout uh, in, in the same manner that they do for a cart, so a virtual cart. So there, the, all these things have massive implications for how tech integrates with each other, uh, opportunities for testing and 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 new ways and ideas. You know, it's it's um, an explosion of platforms um, and 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 ways to deliver content to folks and, and apps to folks. So, I, I think those those uh, items there, those five things, are what we're going to see over the next year or so that could have the biggest impact on uh, on on testing. So, how's that, Jeff? Doing okay? Yeah, let, let me ask you a question because you said two, a sure. couple interesting things. I liked your quote about uh, 30% of a CEO's job can potentially be automated. Um, and, and in many ways, with the growth of automation, that could create a lot of uh, fear for your, you know, your career and your profession. Uh, but then you say, well, then, then there's also more opportunities. So as, as testing professionals and, and, and IT professionals, how, how do you balance those two? Like, am I going to be out of a job or am I going to have more stuff to do than I've ever done before? Well, you know, I, we, we could swerve into that topic for uh, uh, another week. But, you know, I think, and, and advice I typically give uh, testers that want to remain relevant or want to you know, keep their skills current, learning something new or adding another tool to your uh, you know, your box is never going to hurt, right? I, I think there's, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my view on kind of test automation and where I see it heading in, in a minute here, but um, I, I don't see, like, in my years of, and, and this, you know, might be saying a little bit about me, but my 20-odd years of, of managing testing teams, you know, I've never fired a tester because we automated their job away, Right, we've I've gotten rid of lots of operational test management, or 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 you know looked at cost and efficiency and things like that. But test automation typically, in my experience, does not uh, equate to a reduction in resources um, or people. I know some people don't like people being called resources, but um, that has never bothered me. But anyway, um, I I think you know learning new skills, keeping current, um, and and also keeping a sane mind about it where you can chase um, whatever's current uh, and to, 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 to wit's end and never really get anywhere and, and focus on some core skills um, and being adaptable I think is probably more important. So I, I'm, I don't think if you have skills that are relevant in a domain that's growing, you don't need to worry about your job. I hope that remotely answered your question. <laughs> it does. And uh, for those listening, if you have a question, just enter it in the Q&A. And as, as Keith and I do some banter, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to try to get your question in there as well. So keep going, Keith. You're doing great. Okay. So so um, in all of this, like I said, is, you know, my opinion. So, <laughs> um, so now I want to talk about you know testing in 2017 and and beyond a little bit and 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 some opportunities that I see for for testers and 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 testing as an industry you know which I think is you know there's an opportunity for us to respond to things as an industry as well. So, um, one of the first things that I, I bang on about a lot and always did when I was either managing teams or managing large testing organizations is kind of test reporting or, or status reporting. And, you know, I, I believe and still believe there's a valid valid gap in, in the current test till market around test reporting um, and that the market generally is, is pretty, pretty unevolved. Um, you know, organizations have massive investments in test automation uh, tools, scripts, and and still very difficult to to quantify what those returns are. And you know we can argue the the, the toss on um, you know the return on investment for automation. But at the end of the day, you know even just something as simple as as 
progress and status reporting is still still really using the same uh, metrics and and measures that they were from 20 years ago. You know, so I, I think there's a there's a real opportunity in the market right now, and I'm actually trying to do some work around this myself around you know, creating a, a kind of real-time test management decision support, you know, kind of potentially, you know, crossing coverage analytics with, you know, unit and functional testing and monitoring data. You know, there's, there's a lot that could be done there to, to help as, as platforms become more diverse and, and, and spread out and, and the amount of testing we need to do increases – the need for kind of a multi-layered holistic view on progress or quality, however you're defining that, is is really uh, super important. And if you look at things like the kind of self-debugging algorithm that MIT is working on around code, there's all sorts of really rich data sources to help test managers make decisions. I, I think particularly as you integrate you know, a, a higher level of automation and, you know, into your CI, CD uh, model, um, the, the role of a test manager or a quality advocate or quality engineer or whatever you want to call the person who's helping, you know, guide the testing effort, the real-time decision support for that person, I think, is, is, is a massive gap in the market right now and, it, and could, could be met, you know, pretty, pretty readily with, with some, some better reporting. Because if you look at test tools over the last 20 years, you know, some of, there's obviously been advances, um, but it's really just been in one particular aspect. I, I personally think test analytics is, a, is the, the last kind of untapped market for, for, for the testing business. Um, in terms of kind of user experience and UAT, you know, I, I actually see in, in enterprise tech um, a kind of counter trend from the attitude in a lot of tech companies towards bugs in production kind of being deprioritized based on impact. Um, I, I love this quote, uh, quote by uh, Curtis uh, Sternberg. I'll just read it here. He said, every single company I know who is successfully testing in prod doesn't care about a bug unless it hurts 50,000 users or more. Um, you know, that probably washes in some industries, uh, and we'll talk about, you know, testing and production a little bit, but um, if you look at things like BPM or ERP, you know, a lot of this stuff is becoming multi-channel, multi-platform, you know, and, and delivering an increasingly large amount of complexity that needs to be customized to, to, to clients. Um, that user experience and, and, and UAT particularly, and again, validating that, you know, what the, the, the folks were expecting is what they're getting, um, that, you know, is, is still, and I believe, and I said this last year as well, and I think the, the, the feedback I've seen from this and might be, you know, um, confirmation bias, but I've seen this in the, the work that I've been doing with clients in this right now that, you know, user experience is, is increasingly on the rise. And as well, that leads towards folks who, uh, particularly in testing, you know, if you're not specializing in, you know, a particular technology, you know, domain knowledge is, is a valid a currency to trade in as, as technology in some of these cases. So, you know, it, you, can, you can develop into a domain uh, specialist, you know, just as easily as you could the kind of generalized uh, specialist. Um, you know, the, the next point here on, on, on test automation you know, this is obviously a hot topic. You know, um, again, I'm not going to get any specific product uh, um, endorsements, but, you know, continuous integration, continuous delivery adoption, and whatever that means to your organization uh, continues to grow. And, you know, I don't, I don't quote it very much, but they do have some useful numbers in there. Um, the, the World Quality Report, you know, looks at that's still about, you know, sub 20% adoption at the enterprise. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, that's probably based on some, some bad metrics, but, you know, it's, it's obviously pervasive in our, in our business right now. You know, continuous integration and continuous deployment, particularly in its relationship to test automation, has been the hot topic for probably the last five years. And you can see that, you know, in recruiting 
uh, skills and, and looking for folks, you know. The, but there's still, you know, a need for non-technical testers. But, you know, as we, we were talking about earlier, I would never discourage someone from um, – from, from learning something or learning how to code. And, you know, and I, I, I kind of got into a little bit um, with some folks on Twitter the other day about the, uh, a, a report that didn't, didn't get a whole lot of a study that was done. It didn't get a, a whole lot of uh, attention, um, and it, you know, for, for, uh, for whatever reason. But the, uh, the ACM SIG on software engineering put out a paper um, and uh, I, I guess we can blog out all these references I'm making later, Jeff. Um, but it was about uh, test-driven development and a kind of double-blind approach to the benefits versus test last. And, you know, I, I, I quote uh, the, one, of, one of the conclusions there was that TDD does not affect testing effort, software, <laughs> external quality, and developers' productivity. Um, which is an interesting quote when you talk to folks about continuous integration. And again, I'm sure I'm being hate tweeted right now <laughs> all over the world for being against test automation. But you know, I, again, I was kind of poking fun of a, a company the other day about their on, on Twitter about their their approach to uh, uh, marketing their continuous integration, um, continuous deployment, and test automation services, which we're basically using the same arguments uh, from the 80s for, for things like Windrunner and all the kind of front-end app automation. Um, so it's, you know, but, but strategically, you know, it, it, it's super important for the, for, for the enterprise still, which kind of leads me to my sub-point here, which everyone's, you know, had a joke about that little inset there, the, uh, that horrific, you know, agile tube map um that that kind of floated around linkedin and and was was out in the world a little bit and people were saying like what is the state of agile you know that this is representing what we're doing but you know in a weird way it actually kind of accurately does reflect the state of agile and in, in enterprises and you know particularly in places like you know financial services and you know kind of fintech you know, th there's there's lots of confusion about what to do. You know, the agile practices have kind of caught the imagination of the C-suite. But, you know, my experience, um, they've, they've overwhelmed middle management, and um, they, they don't really know what to do beyond solving the technical problems. And, you know, as I like to say frequently, you know, no amount of process improvement is going to solve your underlying problem, which is org dysfunction. So, you know, in regards to testing, you know, there's a huge opportunity for test management um, to take a broader role in kind of advising and defining objectives for, for test automation's practical first steps to get started. And, I, you know, I kind of watching our business, you know, I'm – I, I see some of this stuff out there. There's some folks that are getting that, but there's an opportunity, you know, for testers or consultants beyond agile coaching to really talk about practical first steps and quite happy to amplify any of those voices that are practical. You know, I like a lot of the work, for example, a lot of the work that Richard Bradshaw does um, with some of his automation workshops, you know, giving people practical first steps on how to get started. They've got all this stuff, and they and they don't know don't know what to do with it. Um, which, you know, I think the other half of this here, and particularly, you know, I think it gets missed out a lot, is that in in tandem with any of this, obviously you need to do a significant amount of monitoring. You know, and, and that should inform your test approach, whether that's, you know, info on alerts, prod data, any of that stuff. Um, you know, th to take a holistic view on this, monitoring has to be uh, in, in scope of your kind of CI, CD ap approach, and, and in particular on test automation. You know, there's, there, and there, there's some implications there, and particularly if you get back to, you know, artificial intelligence or maybe machine learning um, uh, to take a kind of, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard of that chaos monkey um, approach that Netflix takes um, towards their their uh, deployments where they, they have, they've got this um, 
algorithm that that uh, terminates uh, virtual services on their uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, Netflix does that, and so it's, it forces them to continually have to adapt to change, which is a really interesting idea and approach towards integration testing, um, which adds in another aspect to this. And I saw a talk um, last year by uh, Dan Billing at the uh, uh, New York Testers Meetup, and he was advocating for some uh, and he around security testing and adding that into your kind of testing stack much earlier than you would. And I think, you know, adding in um, or addressing monitoring as another source of, of uh, information or data to inform previous test phases is not just a good practice, but it's going to become increasingly important uh, to, to, to enterprises. It's something that's done pretty frequently in, in tech companies, but not so much in the, in the enterprise. Um, which, you know, testing in production, you know, I, again, having spent most of my time in the enterprise, you know, we would call, we would say, oops, after we did that. Um, a lot, I remember, you know, years ago when I was working for a pretty large investment bank, um, you know, we ran a bunch of performance tests in the production environment and had to cancel out a whole series of trades. And, you know, <laughs> but that, I mean, that's essentially testing in production, but, you know, there's a there's a really if you're in tech, I mean, if you're in a tech company, there's, there's and, and interested in this. There's a, a really a couple of really good articles that I, I, I read last year. Um, one is about um, uh, the Guardian's uh, membership and subscription uh, approach, and they have a really interesting approach to kind of lightweight uh, pipeline management for continuous deployment. Um, and I think you'll see, you know. It, the, 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 obviously, data is and data management and security are huge issues for testing and production in the enterprise. You know, just look at fintech. You know, the the regulatory implications of testing and production. You know, you're, you're talking multi-country, multi-currency. You've got regulatory prod walls that that can't be breached. So, you know, that there's using production data is very different than testing in production. But I, I, I think there's, there's some opportunities there to crack that, but not, it's, it's still behind. But you, there's, if you could come up with a way to, to manage that and address the regulatory concerns, there's another, uh, there's another market there to, to tap. And the other, the other, I just remember the other article that, um, that I read about this was, uh, in the uh, SD Times by a guy named uh, um, Alex Handy, and that the article was uh, testing in production comes out of the the shadows, which uh, I think is very relevant to to the, the enterprise. It's something that people do, but again, there's usually a uh, you know look around the room as to who did it as opposed to uh, a, a intended uh, event. Um, and, and the last point here, you know, as, as I know a lot of folks who work overseas and a lot of folks who work um, in the enterprise uh, deal with this, and, you know, I've kind of predicting the demise of the enterprise testing COE for a couple years now, and getting some hard data on this in terms of spend, it's um, I'm, uh, proving to be correct on this, you know, the the, the spend on kind of offshore COEs is down year on year from last year, um, despite the fact that most most QA and testing budgets are flat or slightly up. So people are spending more on testing, but they're spending less on their enterprise COE, which you know again to define terms a bit is you know your your you know uh, segregated separated testing center that um, isn't fully integrated into your into your team it may it may test uh, offer testing as a service but it's not integrated in the same way that uh, that uh, you would through a, a more agile approach or a whole team to quality approach and you know there's still in the high 60s to 70 percent of enterprises utilize some form of of testing COE for some aspect to that, and um, you know that's uh, you know people are starting to rethink that, particularly as if you want to increase the 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 speed and velocity of which you deliver stuff to your clients, 
um, having that kind of bolted on, and I've been working with a lot of companies over the last year and, and, and a few this year as well, around integrating, like they've, they've acquired digital mobile companies uh, or a business that's you know, in, in their industry that they now want to bolt into, you know, their 30 year old, uh, reconciliation engine, you know, or, or, or data management group. And how do we, which runs massive, you know, testing COE regression suites, how do we integrate that into a two week delivery cycle? Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's, a, a, I predict that that's going to continue. Um, I, if, and in particular, if I was in kind of an operational test management role um, in a COE, I would be boning up on my skills um, because a lot of these organizations are continuing to reintegrate test teams into their development groups. Um, and I think you'll see, uh, but, but here's a prediction as well. We'll see if this, may, maybe not this year, but at some point, I am predicting, um, you know, you, you can't kill this. You know, this stuff won't die on its own. you got to kill it. So <laughs> I am predicting a resurgence in uh, testing COEs once the, 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 via the kind of Internet of Things, virtual testing experiences, particularly in kind of digital, mobile, and retail platforms that, uh, you know, there are massive investments in these things all over Southeast Asia, India, and Eastern Europe, um, and, 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 and some in the Americas as well, that those investments are not going to be just, uh, you know, hands washed of them. So I, I, I think you could see, you could make a case for um, creating a virtual testing experience um, in some of those, like I said, the digital and retail platforms. Um, but, um, you know, we'll have to see how that goes as the cost of testing gets cheaper and cheaper and labor uh, arbitrage isn't the primary driver anymore, um, you know, th that, that could prove to be wrong as well. So those are my uh, predictions for this year. Let's get into what I think is cool stuff. And this is, uh, again, observations on my part. Um, you know, and using the opportunity to amplify some some voices. I think I've, you know, I was chatting with someone earlier, growing a bit disenchanted with the kind of large software quality and testing conferences. Um, so I think there's, but there's lots of really cool stuff going around in the in, in the world right now that that I'll particularly be hanging out at. Um, aside from you know the the super cool quality jam uh, that that you that you host on Atlanta, which Again, you can you can call me biased, but the speakers that were there last year were fantastic, um, and the speakers that are going to be this year are, are uh, amazing. So, uh, the yeah, obviously Quality Jam is, is a great opportunity to talk to some folks and, and testing, and here's some great stuff. This year, um, I'm I'm excited about uh, the Romanian Testing Conference uh, that's out in May. Uh, these are like smaller, more regional things. Um, Rob Lambert, my buddy uh, Rob, is the conference chair. Um, I'll be doing a keynote and a workshop out there, but they've got some fantastic speakers. Uh, Santosh Tuppet will be there, Hybe Schutz, uh, uh, Alex Schladenbeck, John Stevenson. Um, and amazingly, um, they've got this 12-year-old wonder kid uh, named Harry uh, Gurlia. He's actually giving a keynote. Um, I, I had never heard of this guy but um, he's, a, he's 12 years old and apparently is working his way up through the gaming industry and is now a, uh, a, a super tester um, that's going to be talking there as well. So, you know, I have a 7- and a 10-year-old that tell me what to do all the time, so I'll be, <laughs> be right in my wheelhouse to have a 12-year-old uh, school me on testing. So um, the, uh, the next thing uh, we'll be looking at is uh, Copenhagen Context. You know, I'll be doing a keynote and workshop out there. Again, fantastic speakers. Uh, Paul Holland, Nancy Kellen will be doing a, a keynote. Uh, Smita Mishra, um, uh, Ash Coleman from the U.S. is another fantastic uh, voice in the, in the testing world. Great stuff going out there. I'll also be doing a workshop. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I, and it's running. And let's see, I always used to say Test Bash was my favorite conference, but. Um, you know, I, I, it's running a close, it's running neck and neck with uh, Quality Jam right now. So, 
Um, but I'll be over there in Brighton. Um, again, if you haven't been to Test Bash, you should absolutely go. Um, it's a great community of folks. Lots of stuff that you can get from there, but I'll be doing a workshop, which I'm extremely excited about, that we've, we've kind of riffed around for uh, a, uh, a year now with uh, Martin Hinier and Vernon Richards on how to talk about testing by not talking about testing, which is something that, you know, I've advocated for a very long time that staying, you know, relevant in testing is not about testing. It's about, you know, how do you translate, um, you know, testing into actionable intelligence for your business. And, I'm, you know, I love those guys and uh, super excited to uh, combine kind of the trading zones mentality with Kniafin, with my, you know, kind of uh, enterprise IT hat on. So that should be uh, a really interesting. If you can get out there for that one, that's going to be a big, that's going to be a good one. Um, a book came out last year, a um, friend of mine, uh, uh, Dave Greenleaf. You know, um, loved. I've worked, got the opportunity to work with him for a while, um, but it's a fantastic book uh, called "Software Testing as a Martial Art." It's on Lean Pub, so you know every uh, uh, cover of years, Dave, if you're listening, every book doesn't need to cost you know fifty dollars to buy. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, there's what I really like about that book is one, Dave has a very practical approach to software testing, and taking you know the kind of kata approach to training and it's 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 a really fresh look on how to get better at testing um and i i I highly recommend it um some folks who you know i think if you follow this industry and i'm always amazed at, at how how little people do follow this industry but there's a lot of really great people and you know my opportunity here to uh amplify some voices is you know one right now and she's kind of the i'd say darling of the business right now but angie jones so i just i i really appreciate her perspective she is a uh, you know wicked smart test automation engineer and uh you know she talks about you know agile and automa- automation and agile uh engineering practices like bdd you know she's she's a, and, and the thing i really like um because it strikes close to my heart she's a real powerful voice for uh, diversity in tech and gives back a lot of her time um, to nonprofit initiatives. And I, and I appreciate folks who, you know, walk the walk, the walk and she, she's one of them. Um, another one who I, I highly recommend, if you don't follow, you should do now, which is uh, Trish Koo. She's uh, out in Australia, ex-Googler that just started her own app dev and testing consultancy, but she talks and, and works a lot on test automation and has some really, really fresh ideas and an interesting perspective on kind of whole team approach to quality and how they did that at Google. I, I, think, I think she might have been ex-Microsoft as well. I'm not sure, but she's definitely ex-Google. Um, and, uh, you know, so she's somebody who you should look at. And, and, and lastly, you know, I got turned on to these folks up at the KWSQA um, in Kitchener uh, last year, um, and it's a it's a company called Plato Testing, um, which is founded by Keith McIntosh of uh, PQA uh, Testing fame. Um, you know they are doing some amazing work with uh, a software testing pr- training program they're doing, um, at, uh, leveraging um, Aboriginal testers uh, around Canada. Um, again, a, a topic very close to my heart, and they, they offer outsourced testing services, um, all sorts of great stuff going on up there. So if you can check out or support or give some time to, uh, to Plato testing, I would, I would highly, highly recommend it. So um, with that, Jeff, I think that's me done. Do we have uh, time for some, some questions? Are there questions out there? There, there, are, there are a lot of questions, Keith. Um, so many I've, I've had a trouble keeping up with them, but um, which is which is always a good a good problem, right? Um, just a quick one. Uh, a couple of people asked the, the name of the twelve year old um, kid again, the the wonderkin. Yes, Harry uh, Gurlia. Got it. G I R L E A. Just check out okay. the Romanian testing conference. The guy's bio is out there, so. Um, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to being upstaged by a 12-year-old. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, so you you hit on the um, uh, the center of excellence, the testing center of excellence. That seemed to uh, 
prompt a lot of questions. Um, I'll just I'll fire away with some of these. Uh, one is uh, the question is will will de is the move to DevOps just going to kill the center of excellence? I think it's a combination of things. It's not. It's first of all, I'm I'm not sure what. DevOps necessarily means anymore, you know, I mean, because it's, 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 it's become a highly coached and kind of oversold and kind of very diluted marketing proposition. So what, what I think is killing the, the um, it's not necessarily DevOps, but it's the it, agile in a way is, is killing it more to kind of draw a distinction between these two. And by agile, again, you got to define your, your terms so much in this stuff, um, is really moving towards, you know, kind of product ownership, shorter uh, delivery cycle sprints, a, a much higher whole, uh, high, whole team approach to quality that is looking to address it in every, you know, iteration, every uh, phase of your life cycle. So that, I think, the need for a high-touch, close proximity team is one of the things that, that's killing it. Um, and, and, and as well, the other thing is that I think that, that market – has for years oversold its um, oversold its abilities, and also if you look at the way the, a lot of those companies are valued, and I'll use India as an example. A lot of it's a numbers game, so you know they they talk a lot about how many testers work in their in their their practice, and that's viewed as a competitive advantage or a big thing. There's a lot of like volume means a lot and that runs directly counter to a lot of kind of short delivery cycles high touch high user interaction models so i think that's that's as much of it so it's it's a, it's a market kind of collapsing in and of itself and as well having hired and and built lots of teams out and again i'll use india as an example it's it's just not as you know 15 years ago it was a pure labor arbitrage play it's just not as cheap as it used to be anymore you know um, so I think that's that's what's that's what's killing it. Right. So uh, another a couple questions around offshoring and how the offshore team uh, could work with the center of excellence. Um, or, or if you have a big offshore team, do you even have a center of excellence? What What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I mean, I would define a center of excellence as a kind of horizontal that that is separate is a separate organization, right? And so I I mean I I poked fun of the term center of excellence for a, a long time and because I, I don't I don't it's it's been sold and defined to me in so many different ways it's 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 again borderline meaningless you know but um, the way I would look at it is a, a, a kind of organizational horizontal that is a separate entity so you know in its worst instance it's a black box where you know we the, you you've literally cemented the throw it over the wall mentality where you know it's almost in some instances a an actual wall right where you know we we send code somewhere else they test it they send it back and for everybody who thinks that I'm exaggerating I'm working with a couple major uh, companies right now that have this same approach large financial institutions so it's it's still it's still out there um so so that's 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 how I would define it Got it. Now, a few people on the webinar said they're in the process of establishing uh, a center of excellence, and they were um, they were asking, you know, what what is the value proposition uh, that we need to present to our leadership team to really get them to buy in? What What are your thoughts there? Well, I mean, I, uh, email me, <laughs> and I can talk <laughs> about it. But that's you know, it's, uh, without giving away too much free consulting, um, you know, I would I would say. If, if you are not aligning your organization's objectives to business or IT objectives, meaning like we, we want to reduce our delivery cycles down to two weeks, we want to be able to get the quarterly releases, we have a tech budget decrease of X percentage we're trying to hit. We've got if – if, if your organization isn't aligned towards that or, or able to articulate how it's helping achieve those goals – that's not a business case anyway. Um, so I, I would start from there and work back. Now, I think some things can be done well where, you know, some aspects of test automation. Now, I, I have used multiple models where, like, test automation as a COE where 
you, you kind of buy services internally and cross charge. So we keep all the automation folks in a, in one team and then they go work alongside your team. I've not seen that work real well. What I have seen is where kind of core, um, framework development and maintenance is kept in a small team, but then I believe everybody should be able to, you know, automate and run and enhance their own scripts. So that that's you know a way that's a, a much smaller COE that could that could work in some instances, but a lot of this is going to be driven by your your business objectives, the culture of the organization, and and frankly, one thing that gets overlooked a lot is just uh, the the geography. Where is it going to be? It's very difficult to do short turnaround cycles if you've got you know a 10, 12 hour time difference. It just is. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll tell everyone on the webinar there are way too many questions for us to get to in this session. We're going to take a couple more. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do a blog post uh, after the session uh, that'll be uh, that'll be posted uh, either later this week or next week. That'll answer a lot of these other questions. But there's some great questions out there. Uh, let me get to a couple more. Um, Keith, skill building for testers. Uh, wh what do you see as the um, essential? skills that testers have to be focused on moving forward. We had a lot of questions also around uh, certifications. Are there new certifications or other certifications, and how important are, are those as far as thinking about um, building a skill set for the future of testing? So I would, I would say let's just skip the certification question altogether. Um, you know, I've got my particular views on that. I, I'm, I'm not against certification uh, as a thing. I'm, I'm not a big fan of a lot of the way certifications in tech run now. And I, I, I believe and I like the idea of more of a craftsman approach to, to just tech, right? So, and that's kind of how it works anyway. You know, you learn some stuff, you work alongside people, you know, recommendations are a much, you know, cert certifying capability or, or um, that you, you can actually do the job. Um, competency is much uh, more meaningful, but also much harder to do than I can regurgitate this body of knowledge or facts. Um, but I don't, re I don't want to get too much into uh, certifications because, you know, I've written a lot and talked a lot about it and have a very particular view on it, um, which you can you can check out on my blog or contact me separately about. Um, but core skill sets, and I think you know a lot of this stuff outside of you know technology moves you know, relatively fast in terms of languages or, you know, what, what you need to know right now in terms of what's popular um, or what people are moving towards. A lot of the kind of core skills around things like test design, test approach, communication, test framing, you know, uh, uh, how to actually um, structure a strategy for what we should automate, what we shouldn't automate, those are skills that are high in demand um, and, and invaluable. And they're also, they transfer across industry uh, and technology. So I, I would, um, and in fact, Michael Bolton has written tons on this, far more than, than I could ever um, uh, uh, illustrate now. But th th there's, you know, checking out his website, and he's got some great stuff on testing skills. Um, and I believe as well the, uh, the, the AST put out a skills book um, a couple years ago, I haven't uh, I haven't checked it out recently, but if they've kept it up, but th th those are the th core things that I would I would focus on, and, and it served me very well um, in 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 my career to remaining relevant. Um, when I talk to people who spend money on testing, who are the real important people, those are the things I talk about. Um, they're they're not overly concerned with what particular uh, coding language or automation tool or framework we're using. Great, great. Hopefully that helps. So Keith, uh, how, uh, how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more? Right. So you can check out my blog, which is uh, just qualityremarks.com. Um, one word, qualityremarks.com. Uh, um, you can email me at keithclain at gmail.com, or you can email me at uh, techmark, which is kclain at techmark.com. Great, great. Well, Keith, uh, thank you again. Or I'm on Twitter. So I'm on. I'm on Twitter. Oh, sorry. I'm on Twitter as well, which uh, is just Keith Klein at Keith Klein. Sorry, Jeff. 
Great. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Well, I just want to thank you again for uh, being with us for the third year in a row for your annual uh, testing trends webinar. Uh, this has been fantastic. Everyone, there's going to be a quick survey that pops up once we end the webinar, so if you could please just take that, uh, let us know what you thought, and um, look out for uh, the on-demand link that's going to be sent out shortly, and check the QA Symphony blog in the next few days, and that'll have a recap of the webinar. We'll get to some of the questions uh, that we weren't able to answer today. So again, thank you, Keith. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and have a great day. Bye-bye.